Okay, wake up. I am the second to last thing between you and cocktails, so I'm going to try and make it at least slightly interesting. Uh, I'm a payments lawyer. I was a payments lawyer before it was cool to be a payments lawyer, because I've been doing it my whole career. Um, my, my goal here really is to um, take some of the mystery out of regulation, if possible, or at least make it a little less scary, maybe. Um, I have clients, they come to me and they say, they, they feel like they're about to enter, you know, shark infested waters with a gaping leg wound and they're really worried about it and they don't know what to make, they don't know what regulation is about, they don't know how scared they should be of it, um, and so I try to talk them down often. I succeed, not always. Um, it's uh, the uncertainty that we discussed um, earlier on the panel, the uncertainty around a regulation can be very uh, ang anxiety ridden, um, keep you up at night. So this is, my <laughs> this is my graphic for what keeps you up at night. If you're already, if you're in a startup, you're up at night over lots of things um, already. So I'm just hoping that if I take some of the mystery out of this regulation stuff, you'll be up about your next round of funding or what to pack for Bali or something, but not, but not regulation. Um, I think the best way to do that is to sort of talk a little bit about uh, who the regulators are. Many of you may know that, but so I'll give it a high level, a high level uh, overview. Who does what? First, we have uh, at the federal level, um, FinCEN. FinCEN is the Financial Crimes Division of Treasury, as we discussed. They have a registration requirement for money transmitters. I'm going to use money transmission as the sort of regulation to discuss because it is what most of you, I think, in this room probably be caught up in. Um, there are, of course, you know, a couple Bitcoin related or virtual currency related regulations cropping up here and there. Um, they tend to look a little like the money transmission regulations anyway, so um, I'm just going to use this as an example. Uh, so at FinCEN, there's a, there's a registration requirement for money transmitters. They are mostly concerned with money laundering uh, and financing of criminal activity. They are not particularly concerned with consumer protection or anything like that. Um, that's FinCEN. The Fed, I'm only mentioning the Fed because they're in charge of the stability of the monetary system and they have been mentioned um, with regard to virtual currencies and maybe they're concerned about virtual currencies uh, disrupting the monetary system. But if you're, if you're in, you know, dealing with money transmitter licensing, you're not going to encounter the Fed. Um, the OCC is in charge of bank stability for the big banks, the National Bank, the Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citibank, Chase, those sorts of banks. That's important because you may end up partnering with one of those banks if you're moving money. Uh, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, exactly what it sounds like. They care about consumer protection. Um, and then the states, I think we're going to run out of runway with the, with the slide here, but the states are, um, okay, money transmission is regulated at a state level, mostly. There is the federal requirement with FinCEN, which is a registration requirement, which is sort of telling them what you're doing. At the state level, you need to get a license, which is asking permission to do something. So they're very different uh, postures. So at the state level, they're concerned with consumer protection and secondarily consume, concerned with uh, anti-money laundering. So that's like the really, you know, Cliff Notes version of financial fintech regulation with regard to moving money. Um, we should take a minute to talk about state laws. They follow the consumer. What that means is the state laws are there to protect the residents of that state. So it doesn't matter where your server is. It doesn't matter where you are physically located. If you are making your product available to consumers in that state, you are subject to those laws. Uh, so where are your customers? That's, those are the states you need to worry about. Um, the other thing to think about is that we have many states, and not every single one of them regulates money transmission, but most of them do. And so the laws are slightly different. There, there are some common themes, but they are not uniformly written, and they are certainly not uniformly interpreted. That is, some may decide that they're money transmitter laws will extend to virtual currency platforms and some may not care and think and, and will interpret their laws very strictly uh, by the letter. So uh, they're not uniformly written or interpreted. Lots of states, lots of regulators, all of them have a different opinion. Uh, also, they were written a long, long time ago. These laws, the money transmitter laws, were written when a physical human being would walk into a physical location and hand physical money to another physical human being and you know, it would go li like that. Um, these days, that doesn't happen uh, very often. Uh, but these laws were written uh, back when you had to actually put your pants on to do banking. 
so we have a square peg round hole problem where they're going to be trying to take your new technologies and models and push them into their existing laws. Um, not always with great effect. In fact, almost never with great effect. Now that you know who the regulators are and, and who does what, um, I think important thing to know is what triggers these laws. How do you know when you're about to enter sharky water, basically? Um, so triggering regulation is activity. Most money transmitter laws um, are written basically like this. If you are receiving money for the purpose of passing it along to another party, you need to have a license. I mean, that's a very basic paraphrase, but that's essentially what it is, receiving money for the purpose of transmitting it elsewhere. So that's activity. That's not whether you call yourself a money transmitter. It's not anything like um, you know, what you think you might be doing. If you're doing that stuff, that activity, you're doing regulated activity. Um, that means touching the money. That means often controlling the money. Some states are very strict about, well, you're not actually receiving the money, so we don't care. But some states really do care if you're actually in control of the money, even if you yourself are not receiving it. Then there's perceived activity, as in, are you holding yourself out as a money transmitter? Um, that comes into play if you have a third party doing the regulated activity for you, but they are not visible anywhere on your app or your website and the consumer doesn't realize that someone else is actually moving the money for you. Um, so that's a lack of transparency into partner participation. Some states, notably Washington State, really care about this. Some states do not. So the key to unraveling all this and whether or not you are going to be regulated is what are you doing? Um, I don't mean your ultimate change the world goal. I mean, I have clients come and talk to me and they'll say, listen, we're, <laughs> we're not money transmitters or anything like that. We're just helping a buddy pay back another buddy for lunch. Or, we're helping, we're just helping somebody pay their bills. We're, we're just, you know, helping them create a utopian society. We're not, we're not really money transmitters. It's not like we're PayPal or anything like that. And, um, you know, even PayPal didn't think they were PayPal back then. So uh, it's not what you are thinking you're doing. It's the nitty-gritty details, how the money moves. That is how you analyze whether or not you're going to be covered. Um, who owns the bank account? That's important. Whose name are they held in? Uh, who controls the bank accounts? Who controls the flow of money? Are there opportunities for malfeasance? Not, in, not intentionally <laughs> malfeasance, but are there opportunities for that? And I'm going to talk about that a second later. Um, malfeasance, I mean, is can the money be rerouted? Can you say, yes, I'm taking this money in to pay your cable bill or to send money to your Aunt Matilda in Winnetka, but in fact, I'm going to send it to my own offshore Cayman Island account? Um, do you have someone performing the, the user intake, uh, the merchant onboarding that is checking all the identities and verifying they, who, they are who they say they are? Because that goes to the money laundering issue. If you discover these holes, you need to plug them as soon as possible. There are a number of ways to do that. Mostly it means getting yourself a partner to do the regulated activities. There are other workarounds. Um, but essentially, in order to track what all, what's all happening here, you need to follow the money, um, and this is how you do that. Uh, anyone uh, who is doing a money transmitter analysis will need this sort of thing, a flow of funds chart, which shows, and I just cobbled together a really quick one with my extremely rudimentary PowerPoint skills um, to show, you know, okay, here's where the money is coming in here, it's going out this way, it's doing this, and what's happening in the middle. That is important in order to just really help someone who's doing an analysis figure out if you need to be licensed or if you don't. Um, so I'm giving a really quick overview here. Now that we've talked a little bit about what the regulations kind of, how they're set up, um, I, th I think it's really helpful usually for my clients anyway to find out what the regulations are trying to control for. Are they just arbitrary and inscrutable and just there as a barrier to entry into this uh, industry, or are they based on solid, sound concern? Um, it's a little of each, I think. Um, the policies behind regulation, essentially, boiled down to their essence, and I find it's helpful when I'm talking to clients to say, look, I know these aren't your actual stated goals of your business model, but these are the things we need to make sure optically it doesn't look like you have the opportunity to do. Don't steal money. That seems logical, right? Don't steal money. That is one of the policies behind regulation. That is why for money transmitter licensing, they require surety bonds. Surety bonds are performance bonds. It means that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. That means rerouting funds. That's, that's stealing money. 
Uh, don't launder money, another solid, very solid regulatory <laughs> policy. Um, and, uh, and that means verifying your users, making sure you do have an anti-money laundering policy in place, even if you haven't gone through the process of getting a license yet or registering with FinCEN, it's really helpful to make sure you at least have an AML compliance uh, policy in place. Um, that includes analyzing the transactions for things like structuring and making sure that someone isn't actually laundering money. Don't facilitate crime. Another really sound policy to put behind a regulation. Um, that means if you think that your website can be used or your app can allow for crime, that will actually cause regulators to come and look at you more carefully. Uh, so you want to sort of check your website and make sure none of this stuff is possible. Also, don't mislead people. Don't say you're going to do one thing and do something else. Now, none of these are actual business models. No one is sitting in this room going, damn, I had this stealing money thing down until she told me it was against the law. Um, the point of this is to say, regulators, look at your sites and your apps and your business models with these things in mind. And even if it's not something you are overtly doing, they're going to look to find out if it can be done or if you have certain controls in place to keep it from happening. Also, don't script the monetary system. That kind of goes without saying. So I promised to talk about workarounds. Um, one of the things about workarounds is that they're very specific <laughs> to each model. Like, what works for this guy isn't going to work for this person, and, and they're very specific. But the one that works for almost everyone is bank partners. Now, I tried to find a dinosaur in a suit that was friendlier looking than this one, but I couldn't. I could only find a mean dinosaur in a suit. So this is not a reflection on actual bankers. That's just the only graphic I could find. So what to know about banks? They're freighted with lots of regulation. Uh, anyone in a startup is trying to avoid regulation. Banks can't do that. They're banks. They're very regulated, and they have to sort of work with the tools they've got. They can't be nimble. They cannot be nimble because they are freighted with regulation, and they also have layers and layers of management. And so while you can make your decision in you know 10 seconds or 10 minutes, banks have to go cycle through layers and layers of management in order to get anything done. And that can take an excruciatingly long time in the life of a startup. Um, they are used to things being done in a certain way. Uh, it, that's one way of saying they're used to getting what they want. Uh, and in many cases, they have all the leverage, uh, and so that will happen. But it is important when you're uh, working, especially if you're going to work with a bank partner, that you have a lawyer that knows how to speak to banks and understands where they're coming from and can say, well, listen, I know you're used to getting this, but you don't actually need it under the law and can actually speak bank to them and make sure they understand they don't get to have what they want just because they're used to getting it. There has to be an actual legal basis for them to ask you to give them something. Um, they also have to deal with regulatory guidance about dealing with third parties like tech companies and startups that are, that are going to be partnering with them. There is actual guidance they have to follow with regard to who they can partner with. However, all of that being said, they're very valuable partners because uh, they are exempt from money transmitter licensing and lending laws and things like that. They know the regulations and they can help you, they can help guide, guide you and make sure that you don't run afoul of something and, uh, and they'll want to make sure you don't run afoul of something because you're one of their partners. And they're looking to partner with technology companies. Uh, I represent some banks, I represent a bunch of tech companies and, uh, and everyone wants to, they do want to work together uh, because they need each other. That said, <laughs> there is a huge culture clash between the, you know, cowboys of the tech world who want to move fast and break things and the methodical, <clears throat> slow-moving uh, banks that are very cautious. Now, um, that's one of the things I do a lot, is serve as sort of an interpreter. Having, I represented banks for like eight years before I pivoted to tech, and, um, and one of the things is sort of that, that is necessary in these situations is sort of an interpreter kind of smooth things over, talk people off of ledges, and make sure that everyone is playing nice in the regulatory sandbox. Um, but just bear in mind that banks, uh, you know, they don't, again, move fast and break things. They don't fail harder. That's not what they look for. Um, that there's, there's certain things that, that are sort of unappealing to, to banks, and so we need to bear that in mind when dealing with them. Um, banks can be extremely innovative. It's just that they have to do it within the tools they've got, which is the regulations and the layers of management. Those, that's the biggest workaround. So here's some things that are not workarounds that many of you have probably considered. Ignoring the regulation. Maybe if I just ignore it, it'll go away. It'll never come up. I don't recommend that. How about launch first and ask questions later? Maybe, it, look, 
just going to launch. I hope this never comes up. Um, but if it does, we'll deal with it at that point. Uh, here's one that's very popular in, in the Valley anyways. It's easier to get forgiveness and permission. Absolutely true. It is easier to get forgiveness per than permission. But I cannot recommend that, not on stage, as a way for you to deal with your business. But I can say this. If you're going to follow this, uh, you know, well-worn philosophy, um, try to make sure that you do as much as possible uh, that requires less forgiveness at the end of the day. So if you can have your anti-money laundering stuff uh, buttoned down and the only thing that's missing is you didn't get yourself a license, you're going to have an easier time of it when someone finally demands you get a license because you will have been doing all the things that you're supposed to have been doing all, all along. This isn't me telling you it's okay to not get a license. This is me telling you if you make that independent decision on your own, it sure would be a good idea for you to make sure that you've done the stuff that you would have been doing all along had you been licensed. Um, so if you end up in a situation where a, regular ask, a regulator approaches you, let's say, um, first of all, don't panic. Uh, oh, you can't see this guy. This is, a <laughs> this is my picture that I found that reminds me of what regulators look like. The, the typical underpaid, overworked, stressed out uh, person with a big pile of stuff on his desk. Um, not an evil, I could easily have put like some evil face up here, but I did not. I put this guy. So, uh, and the reason for that is that when you um, encounter a regulator, chances are good it will beca be because you get a letter from a regulator in a certain state saying, hey, Texas here, we think maybe you need to be regulated and here's what our law says and we think probably you need to have a license to do what you're doing. Please explain to us what you're doing and we want the following things. So if you get a letter like this, it's probably because that guy with the big stack of paper got a tip from somebody that they should look into your site. Not because he has all the time in the world to go out and look at all the websites in the world and decide, wait a minute, I'm gonna look at this guy. Probably they got a tip from somewhere. Not usually actively looking for violators. The, the first step they'll take is they'll send an inquiry letter like I just described, asking you to talk about what you're doing, provide them with some information, uh, and, and explain, uh, especially, by the way, uh, a flow of funds. Typically, they don't just shut you down. So that's the one thing that my clients are always concerned about. Wait, I got a letter from a regulator. They're gonna shut me down tomorrow. Not usually, no. They want to have you explain to them what you're doing. Um, if you explain to them what you're doing and you do it adequately, they won't shut you down. They, if they, even if they decide you need to get a license, oftentimes they'll just give you a chance to operate, um, you know, maybe in some limited capacity while you get licensed up. Um, your initial response to such a thing is crucial. You need to be able to explain to them um, your, your flow of funds, the chart that I said before. You need to explain to them why you are not covered by the law, because we have this workaround, or because we are exempt for this reason. We have, here's why we're not, here's why we're not covered. Um, you need to have a lawyer who understands and speaks payments and understands the laws and regulations. Um, that's a point that we were making earlier on the regulatory panel. It's not a self-promotion thing. It's not a hire me thing. It's a look. <laughs> it's much harder to backfill uh, after you have gotten so far down the road without having a legal counsel than it is if you just talk to us to begin with. Um, and you need a lawyer with some amount of finesse. Um, so here's a story. Uh, I, had a, I had a woman call me one time. She was absolutely panicked. She'd received a letter from a regulator saying that she thought they thought she needed to be licensed. She had consulted her regular corporate counsel, and they looked at the letter, and they freaked out like their hair was on fire, and they said, you, lady, <laughs> you need criminal defense counsel. Under these laws, we see the penalty here is criminal. You, can, you guys can go to jail. There's going to be millions of dollars in fines. You need to get, you, we need to get you some criminal defense counsel. So she was up for a couple months wondering what to do. And she consulted another couple firms, and they all came to the same conclusion, that she absolutely needed to bring on some criminal defense counsel because this was going to be hairy. It was going to cost millions of dollars. People were going to jail. This was not going to go well for them. And then somehow, I'm not sure how she got to me. She called me, and I said, okay, well, send me the letter. Yeah, it sounds bad. Send me the letter. Okay, now tell me what you're doing. So I got her to give me all the stuff I needed. I, did, I took a look. This is a law I happen to know well, and I thought, well, you know, they're not covered by this law. Um, and they're not covered by this law mostly because it was a really badly written law. But just the same, they were not covered. So I called her and I said, listen, I want to call the regulator and talk, talk to him about this. Okay, fine. So I called the regulator. 
I explained, listen, we don't think we're covered by this law, and here's why, A, B, C. And he said, well, that's one way to look at it. And I said, well, that's how we're looking at it. How about that? And he said, all right, well, let me, let me talk to you know, the, the next guy up the chain and call you back. Okay. So he did that, and he called me back. He said, okay, yeah, we agree. You're not covered. I said, oh, gr great, thanks. It doesn't always happen that way. Oftentimes, if they decide you're not covered, you just never hear from them again. This guy actually was nice enough to call back and say, you're not covered. So I could call my client and say, hey, listen, never mind so much about the jail time and the millions of dollars in fines. Um, you're not covered. And she was very grateful. And I felt I you know, did a little happy dance <laughs> and <laughs> sent her a bill for $1,500. So um, if, you, if, if someone really knows the law, um, it, you, can, you can actually you know, get through these things. Um, she had been given some bad advice by people who didn't know the law. And so it's really important to make sure that you engage specialists early on. Um, and that's, I, I could easily have used that keep calm and carry on kind of graphic that everyone uses for everything these days, but I went with Obi-Wan because I believe the Jedi mind trick is probably more powerful than the keep calm and carry on. Um, now, there's another way. There's another, it's not a workaround. It's an actual get license uh, option. If you think you need a license, should you just get licensed? Maybe. Maybe you should. Um, let's look at the factors. Can you fly under the radar? That is the sort of easy to get forgiveness and permission approach that I don't advocate. But it is something you need to consider when you're, when you're thinking about uh, getting money transmitter licenses. So can you fly under the radar? That depends. Are you a Google, or an Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Amazon, something like that? If so, get licensed. There's no way you can fly under the radar. Um, but if you are not big like that, possibly you could fly under the radar. Have a chance to prove your business case and, uh, and get your legs under you, get some more funding, and then comply. Not legal advice, just an observation. Um, you may have some runway. I did not say that. Um, assuming, by the way, that you're controlling for the evil that the policies are, are in place to combat. That means have an AML policy, do OFAC screens, things like that um, will go a long way towards uh, getting the forgiveness you're going to seek after having not complied with getting a license. Um, another thing is if you have a viable workaround, if you can come up with a viable workaround, either um, by tweaking your model or getting a bank partner or another exempt partner, you also don't need to get licensed because you have a workaround. Um, but, but in general, that's the analysis you have to do whether you decide to, when you're deciding whether or not to get a money transmitter license. Also, can you afford it? That's, part of the, that's one of the factors because cost of compliance, let's see. Application fees, surety bonds, legal, background checks, and a lot of time. It can take about a year. Um, all of that together, about one and a half to two million dollars to get licensed, essentially. I mean, that's a, a like real vague ballpark, but it's not too far off. It really depends on how much volume you're expecting and all that. But it could be lower, but it could also be higher. The chances are it'll be lower, but still not a small number for a startup. Um, however, there are costs to noncompliance also. Civil penalties which are fines, criminal penalties. Some states actually have criminal penalties, particularly for willful violations, so bear that in mind. Um, there will be investor concerns. I'm often called in to look at companies that uh, my clients are, are considering investing in, and they want to know, hey, are they compliant? Are we going to have to hold back some money in escrow for the money we're investing, or if we're going to acquire this company, keep some money in escrow for later based on regulatory concerns in case that you know they end up having to pay big fines. So. Uh, Investor concerns over compliance can slow down or halt money maybe you're expecting. So all of that stuff, um, cost of compliance, cost of non-compliance is something you need to factor in when you're, when you're thinking through this stuff. And because I miss David Letterman, I did a top 10 things about fintech regulation that I'm hoping that you can think through. The first one is engage payments counsel <laughs> early to avoid surprises, especially if, you're gonna, if they're going to suggest to you you need you know, not maybe not even just licensing. Maybe they say, well, you just have a disclosure here, and that's maybe going to cause a programming change, and you need to put that in the programming queue. That's just something you want to know ahead of time because it'll end up saving you money. Even so, you're going to have surprises. There will be always surprises. Uh, regulators are working with really old laws, like Civil War era laws. They're really old. Banks, banks are not evil. Banks may be good partners to you if you properly understand them and you understand what it is they need to control for, and 
what they might just be asking for because they're used to getting that versus what they actually need under the law. Uh, the sixth thing to know is it can be done, but probably not the way you think. Also, if it's innovative, there's possibly no law on it yet. Um, and so we're all working in the gray area. I'm comfortable in the gray area, but not everyone is. Um, but that goes to sort of a question as to whether regulation is good or bad. Sometimes regulation is good because it takes away the uncertainty that keeps you up at night. Um, we all know tech moves at the speed of thought. Law, not so much. Um, law takes a much longer time to catch up with what you guys are all doing. So just bear that in mind. Patience is required. This one should be number one. Don't panic. Because there, there's, always a, there's always something that can be worked through. We can always talk to somebody and, and work something out. Most important thing is below the line, you can't even see it, keep your sense of humor. Okay, so one more person and then cocktails. 